Hello. Welcome back to our series, Behind the Scenes of Nautilus. I'm Commander Brad Boyd, Director at Submarine Force Museum and Officer in Charge, Historic Ship Nautilus. This episode, we're going into Sonar, Electronic Support Measures Bay, and the ship's office. No questions from the last episode, but if you do have any questions about this one or any previous episode, please let us know. Do our best to answer. But with that, on with the tour. So last episode, we we're in the attack center, which we're standing in right now. Just one thing to remember, the officer of the deck could see some of the sonar displays. So that's a repeater here and here, as well as another repeater up here to show the different traces that they're looking at. Remember those, because you're going to see them again when we go into sonar. So, uh, left off last week, talking about navigation, which sonar does have an aspect to play with navigation. We'll get to that in a minute, um, as I step down here off the con. So we come back around. And this window here, that's into sonar, so this is where you would normally see uh, on the tour route. So that's what you'd see going into sonar. And then we're gonna go over here. You'd also be able to see in this door, we're actually going through it. And now we've stepped into sonar. So the first thing, we should probably discuss how sonar exactly works. Sonar is sound navigation and ranging, S-O-N-A-R. It can be used in two different ways, both active and passive. Active sonar, which is the sonar that you think of when you think of a submarine and the, and the sending of a ping into the water, is an active transmission of energy that's been turned into sound. That sound goes into the water, travels uh, a ways, finds an object, bounces off that object, and returns back to your ship, uh, specifically to the sensor, which would be a underwater microphone or hydrophone. When it returns, you've been able to measure the time it took from the time you transmitted the pulse to the time it returns to you. If you take that time and then uh, multiply it by the speed of sound of water, you know the total distance that pulse took to get back to you. So let's say it took 10 seconds, and the speed of sound of water is about 4,900 feet per second. So at 10 seconds, that's 49,000 feet of travel for that piece of, uh, for that equipment. Uh, excuse me, for that sound. 49,000 feet of travel, It's the contact's only half that distance away because half of the distance was going there, the other half was coming back. So divide that by two. So 49,000 divided by two is 24,500. So the contact's 24,500 feet away, which in uh, yards is about 8,166 yards, which is about four nautical miles away. So that could be uh, a piece of land, that could be an uh, underwater mountain, that could be a uh, ship on the surface, it could be a submarine, whatever it is. The energy went out, struck an object, came back to you. That's great for the ship because you know exactly what bearing that contact's on, and then you know exactly the range now. The problem is you put an active energy transmission in the water, and if what you're pinging has the ability to receive sonar, then it knows that something came and struck the ship and those energy struck the ship and therefore there's a contact out there that is emitting sonar. So you've also given away that you're there. They know what bearing that that sound came in on so they know what bearing you are to that ship. Now, if they're uh, able to, if the, there's enough energy left from the t uh, pulse that went out and then came back to you, it's going to bounce off of you as well. If they can then hear that return, then they know how long it was between the time that the pulse hit them and then return to them, and they also know your range. So you could be giving away all of your information by emitting active sonar. As a result, we don't use active sonar all that often. We typically use passive sonar. Passive sonar is just listening. It's using that, that hydrophone, the underwater microphone, to listen to the environment. Now, you're gonna pick up, things that are definitely biologics, whales, fish, shrimp. Uh, you're also gonna pick up things that are uh, uh, for the earth, uh, ocean. Uh, flow noise, you're going to pick up underwater activity, you're going to uh, be like uh, uh, underwater hydrothermic vents, uh, underwater uh, uh, volcanoes, uh, th those types of things, seismic activity in the water, uh, uh, in the ocean floor. Oh, you pick up all that as well, it's kind of the background noise. But you're also going to pick up things that are distinctively man-made, engines, propellers, hydraulic trans, uh, that type of stuff. So, that's what passive sonar does. The problem is, passive sonar, I know I have energy down that bearing. I don't know how far away it is. Um, I don't, and I don't know exactly what it is. I have to listen to it over time to figure out, is it man-made or natural? And then I've got to take that time for it to develop. So you've got this trace up here that you see. It's 
so we'll go into this and you kind of saw this on the on the con as well so you're going to get a trace so the energy comes in and by the way this is most recent is on the top uh most past is on the bottom uh time on the, uh time is on the y-axis um, and you can switch the speed at which, uh, I don't know if you can see it or not, but there's a switch for how fast, slow or fast, for how fast that trace is going to go, uh, that paper's going to go, so you can get it uh, quick fall, waterfall to see what the qu trace is doing quickly or a long-term display to figure out what the trace has done over a period of time. But you're looking at it and you have a bearing rate. So there's this bearing at this time and then here and then here and then here and then that change in bearing from here to here over time, that's your bearing rate. So you see this trace had a quick bearing rate, then steadied up and stayed still, and then another quick bearing rate. Um, so that's either the contact turned or the contact uh, came in, hit CPA, uh, closest point of arrival, uh, closest point of approach, excuse me, and then came back out, or a whole bearing of, of things could have happened in this. Uh, the ship could have turned, although from the other traces it doesn't look like it did. Um, anyways, but that's a long leg problem. You're going to take minutes, sometimes many minutes, to figure out what that contact's doing. And if it maneuvers, you got to start over on some of this stuff. So passive sonar is a long, drawn-out process, um, but it is safety of ship because that's how that's the only way you can really see in the world is through sonar. So passive sonar uh, is the primary means of use on board a submarine, um, and they would use that for both collision avoidance, safety of ship, as well as contact determination. What's going on uh, if they're going to prosecute a target? So um, now the next thing you. Uh, may not realize is sonar has a lot to do with safe navigation and that's this piece of equipment right here this is called a pedometer so pedometers use active sonar pretty much continuously um, and what that does is it sends an active pulse straight down from the bottom of the ship to the ocean floor it waits for its return and goes okay i transmitted it this time it took this long to come back i have this much depth beneath the keel with that information, that's your only true piece of information of where you are in the world is the depth beneath the keel. So you've got charts and you you know what you're expecting to see. You know what course that you're steering. You know what uh, speed you're going through the water, but you don't know the speed you're making over ground or the course you're making over ground because you don't have an external fixed source. You're just guessing. You don't know what set and drift is doing to you. It's like that the headwind or tailwind discussion we were talking about in the last episode. So you've either got the quartermaster saying, I'm going this fast on this course, and his dead reckoning guesses to where the ship is, or you have the inertial navigator using the gyroscopes that we talked about last episode that is estimating ship's position based off the acceleration it felt in the X, Y, and Z axis, uh, axes. Um, and so, but those are still just estimations. The only way to get a fix is to come up and either shoot the star fix we talked about with the sextant, pick up a, a Loran C, which is the radio frequency, visual bearing fix, although you're probably not coming to periscope depth the first time able to shoot visual bearings. Um, you're probably going to approach land from periscope depth, but you never know. Um, and then you've got satellite fixes. Um, once again, when Nautilus was first starting out, satellite fixes were not that reliable in terms of when they gave you a fix, it was great, but they weren't always in a position to give you a fix. So you have to have an external fix source to really determine what set and drift is doing to then have a better estimation of your position and to, and to fix it. The pedometer here is the only thing that gives you actual truth in the environment around you. I am this far off the ocean floor. So critical important piece of information for a submarine, especially since we operate in three dimensions. We go along and we want to make sure that we're not going to run into a mountain. So you watch for that with uh, 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 the pedometer. Now, the pedometer... As I said, works in active, and so you may be going, well, well you just told us that active is bad because it can give away ship's position. It, it's a different type. Um, so it's, it's active sonar, but it's a, as minimum power as can possibly be to get a return, and it's fired in a very narrow direction straight down and coming straight back up. So the, really the only way for a uh, contact to intercept that sound energy is to be either directly above or below you. Um, so it's a, it's a minimal risk compared to the huge gain of knowing where you are in the water column so that you don't go aground. So, but that's the pedometer. Um, as we go in here, so this would have been the active sonar set. Uh, I'm going to do my best to get you the pictures without the glare, so uh, bear with me. This is the active sonar set, so they would use uh, um, this to transmit their uh, pulse out and then see where it comes back in. And then you've got the passive sonar set over here. That's the trace that I was showing you. Um, and they would actually be able to steer 
where their hydrophone was. So they didn't have hydrophones all over the place and a computer determined they, they steered best direction for the hydrophone of the trace they wanted to track and they listened to it. And that's what they did there. This, by the way, uh, that information would also be sent to the officer of the deck and his station, depending on what speed he wanted the information transit, uh, uh, recorded from this piece of equipment. So, uh, you have recording systems over here so that you'll be able to record the tape of, of what you're listening to. Um, this helps with, you know, reconstruction of if you did something uh, and ran into something, figure out what exactly went wrong, kind of like the black box. But really what it's there for is to uh, provide the ability to record information off the contact you're listening to so that we can learn from that contact. Every contact that you come to has specific sound characteristics. We want to record that information so we can better understand what that contact is, uh, what its capabilities are, and all that when we do analysis later. So. Uh, another one of the repeaters you can set to different time speeds so you'd have uh, supervisors in here supervising them as well so uh, this is you know belt driven here just rolls paper down you'd have to be able to go in here to uh, change the paper out once again you see different traces trace 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 um, all that information okay all right so that's sonar um, they would have a supervisor in here, sonar supervisor, who would watch what the crew is doing, uh, the, uh, the, the stacks are doing, each one of these is a different stack, watch his operators uh, manage the stacks, and then he would report information to the officer of the deck via, uh, obviously via the recording system that uh, translates that information back out, but also he would have uh, announcing circuits, uh, microphones that he could grab and uh, make reports uh, to the officer of the deck or to fire control or in the pathometer's case to the quartermaster, whoever it is they need to talk to, to report that, that information out of, out of the shack. All right, so that's sonar, and next we're going on to uh, ESM. We'll turn around here, pardon me as I come out of sonar. ESM is basically passive sonar, but for the air. If you're an electronic signal, or if you're a ship that emits an electronic signal, it can be intercepted and analyzed. Now, they are not going to be able to get the as accurate a bearing as sonar can, just the way that the system works. So they're not going to be able to know it's you know down bearing three three five, but they could say that it, hey, it's in the north northeast or the northeast or northwest, whatever co uh, coordinate you're looking for. Um, north northeast would have been like zero one five, um, but. They can take that information and they take the frequency that they receive, the pulse repetition, the pulse width, and the scan type if it's a radar, and they can say, hey, it's a navigation radar or it's a fire control radar. If it's a fire control radar, you know it's a warship. If it's a navigation radar, it could be just about anything to include a warship because they have both. Um, and then they also take that and they can combine that with the information they get from sonar. Say, hey, we've got a fire control radar carried aboard American warships. British warships, Soviet warships. Not only that, they can go, hey, it's carried aboard this specific type of warship. So it's on board a destroyer or a cruiser or this class of warship. Um, and they take that information and they work with sonar and go, okay, so it's carried on these two types. We know it's one of these two types. And so therefore you can figure out exactly what the contact is, even if you can't see that contact. Um, all the equipment that you see here, so this is used to uh, boost the signal or and filter out extraneous signals so you can isolate the signal you want to look at and then figure out the frequency, the pulse repetition, the pulse width, and the scan. If you're in the middle of the ocean, it's really easy. You might have one or two signals. If you're on a shipping lane or close to, close to land, you could have tens if not hundreds of signals you got to work through as to which one you're trying to look at. So that's what all this equipment does. It helps you filter out, isolate, so that you can then do your ana analysis on that signal. Um, you also have the ability to record um, so that you can take that information and send it off afterwards uh, for analysis as to what all you saw in your mission, your operation, whatever you, whatever you did. So, Now, as I said, ESM is useful at periscope depth. It's not really useful on the surface unless you're not running your radar because your own radar is so close to you know, the mass that's going to hold uh, your signals intercept for ESM that you're just going to saturate it. You're not really going to get much information out of it. So as, as I said, ESM at periscope depth. Now the operator you see with the uh, announcing circuit here, he'd be able to communicate with the officer of the deck or with sonar uh, and tell them what he's seeing out there. Very critical as you're coming to periscope depth because when you come to periscope depth and you're changing from purely submerged to operating right next to the surface, 
you're putting yourself in stratum with surface ships that you can collide with. And so ESM, when you first come up, is going to help figure out, do you have a really close contact? As I said, you can't figure out range, but you can figure out if there's a contact there, especially if you weren't expecting one. ESM can be your first clue in. Uh, if the scope's not seeing it, you come up in a rainstorm, so you have, even though the scope's out of the water, you can't see anything just based off visibility or fog or what, what have you. So uh, ESM is a critical part of that. Uh, and then, as, as I said, as you develop the contact picture, as you spend your time periscope depth or an analyze a contact that you're uh, following, it can give clues as if you're following a warship, hey, it lit off its fire control radar, it's about to do an exercise, or it might be ready to engage another, another ship or aircraft, or you if you got detected, so maybe it's time to get out of there. Uh, so ESM is uh, critical to help figure out uh, a contact's intentions as well. So that's ESM, and then we're going to go on to uh, ship's office here. All right, ship's office is the home of the yeoman. Uh, yeoman is a rating within the Navy, uh, as we discussed in the stateroom episode uh, when we were in the exo stateroom, that is equivalent to an office assistant. Uh, they're responsible for running all day-to-day -day administration, as well as the command's communication to outside agencies uh, for the administrative needs of the ships and crew, like pay, sailing lists, official letters, evaluations, fitness, report, uh, fitness reports, uh, all of that, as well as uh, personnel records would all be maintained uh, here in ship's office and the varying stores that you see here Standard file cabinet door so uh, They would also do things like uh, generate ships instructions policies uh, plan of the day uh, Would also be done here in the uh, ship's office uh, Ship's office functions to consolidate the off ship and on ship bureaucracy uh, necessary for uh, for any large organization. <laughs> Without the office, the day-to-day uh, -day function of the ship would be, come to a grinding halt. Uh, the crew would be inundated with having to take care of their own uh, records and correspondence as opposed to focusing on the maintaining of the ship and having, it'd be like trying to operate a company without human resources or a payroll department. It just doesn't work so well. So, all right. Next episode, we're gonna continue on to the control room and to radio. Uh, we're going to do that by going back down here and down this, the grand staircase, which we'll talk about next episode. And uh, from that, we'll go on to cruise mess. Uh, thanks for coming along and hope to see you again. Bye.